Given Professor Riss's wide range of interests and topics of analysis, it is hard to characterize his scholarship as any chosen category in which to place it can be easily criticized and discarded as being too narrow. But since I want to try and reach beyond a mere enumeration of his various formal positions, such as Professor Emeritus of Classics and Philosophy at the University of Toronto, Visiting Professor at the Institutum Patristicum Augustinianum in Rome, and holder of the Father Kurtz Pritzel OP Chair in Philosophy at Catholic University, let me describe him to you as a historian of ancient and late ancient thought with a focus on philosophical, moral, and theological thought, but with interests that range far beyond the time frame of antiquity and late antiquity. I first got to know Professor Rist when I took his year-long seminar on the early Augustine in the Classics Department at the University of Toronto in 1983-84. From what I recall, the way in which I'm introducing him now um, uh, is totally contrary to how would he would conduct his small seminar, as I do not remember him having any books or notes, uh, for that matter, in front of him. He would just speak. And by that, I do not mean to say that he would just talk to us about Augustine, but rather that he would talk Augustine in an intense, serious, and profound manner which I'd never encountered before. The seminar, intimidating as it was, introduced me to the early Augustine in a way that I do not think could have been either more excellent or more thorough. Thus, I must be one of the very few students who ever read and presented on Augustine's De Immortalitate Anime which is, if I remember correctly, the only text about which Augustine states in his retractations that he wished he'd not written it. Still, I learned a lot from reading this text and much more from the seminar, such that it took me years before I would gradually warm up to the later Augustine, as the early Augustine had such a magnetic hold on me. Whereas Professor Rist, when I first got to know him, was perhaps best known for his book Plotinus, The Road to Reality, Cambridge uh, 97, uh, 1967 and an Italian edition from 95, which still is a classic, the seminar I attended seemed to some extent a change of course, if not for him personally or intellectually, then certainly for scholars in the field of ancient philosophy, as his interest led him from Plotinus to Augustine rather than to Proclus or Iamblichus. Thus mine, and I'm sure other seminars, fed into what may now well be Professor Riss' best-known book, namely Augustine, Ancient Thought, Baptized, Cambridge 94, and an Italian edition in 97 and a Spanish edition planned. It is a magnificent account of Augustine's whole thought, which is so often portrayed by philosophers as a Christian diversion from some straight ancient philosophical path, while in Christian theological circles, it is to this day still often read confessionally, culminating in the Calvinist Augustine with a focus on double predestination. While Professor Rist has continued to be enormously productive with books such as Man, Soul, and Body, Essays in Ancient Thought from Plato to Dionysius in 96, and Real Ethics, Reconsidering the Foundations of Morality, Cambridge 2001, and What is Truth, From the Academy to the Vatican, Cambridge 2008, um, I think it is fair to say that Augustine has remained at the center of his thought, and that his engagement with Augustine remains perhaps the determining factor in the views he has developed about Western culture, both in its historical and its contemporary configuration. I'm sure, therefore, that Augustine will be present in his lecture today, which is otherwise briefly and provocatively entitled, We Don't Do Truth. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Riss to the University of Chicago. I said to uh, Thomas Levergood before that I'd talk vaguely in the spirit of Augustine. Uh, I hope that doesn't turn out to be a lie. Um, Augustine, of course, being the arch foe of lying, who regarded lying in matters of religion as the worst form of lying. Now, I gloss that by saying that this paper will deal with claims that Augustine would insist are true and without which nothing he says would stand. 
I can't describe it as theological, except in Augustine's sense that you start with non-Christian notions and take it from there. But it will include bits of amateur sociology, amateur, amateur theology, and even amateur literary criticism. And I think that such variation could be edifying for at least three reasons. First, because in philosophy, as distinct from logic, there are no bare arguments. That is, arguments whose premises don't carry baggage, which needs to be identified if their true implications are to be understood. Second, because as I shall try to show, truth seems to be too important to be left to the mercies of at least a large number of modern philosophers and theologians. Third, because some philosophical and theological truths, not only those of a scientific caste, are necessarily inaccessible. We lack the relevant data at certain stages of human inquiry. So I'll go straight down now into Plato's cave, from the abstract to the earthy, from the high-flown and general theoretical talk to its practical manifestations in the doings of some of our, in this case, largely British politicians. In Britain, Alistair Campbell, Tony Blair's press secretary in the glorious and less glorious days of New Labour, enlarged his minor place in the history books with the line, in the Labour Party, we don't do God. Augustine was thought, probably rightly in view of Campbell's by then well-established reputation, that his words necessarily implied we don't do truth either. But however Campbell might have explained what truth is, and one of his colleagues, Peter Mandelson, nicknamed the Prince of Darkness, claimed that it's the job of a spin doctor to create truth, he probably would not have asserted that truth didn't exist. Otherwise, he shouldn't have been, or seemed to be, so angry when people actually accused him of lying. And as a political advisor, he certainly knew what lying is. I remember an Australian ex-cabinet minister once turned late vacation seminarian and soon to become priest, replying to an earnest young Catholic in a forum about morality and politics when asked what he would have done in such and such circumstances, giving, giving the truthful answer, lie, of course. Nevertheless, you sometimes hear people, using from the chattering class as if it's explicit, say or imply that the only thing that's true is that there's no such thing as truth. Probably what they might more generally be supposed to be trying to say is that the only thing that we think we know is that it's impossible to know whether we know anything or not. That was the position, roughly, of those called Pyrrhonists in the ancient world, who asserted it, with whatever implied truth claim, against those who dogmatically said that it's impossible to know, as distinct from having opinions about, anything at all. And the Pyrrhonists seem to think that to reach this conclusion is a guarantee of happiness and freedom from anxiety, which looked about as odd as the recent atheist, or not too recent now, but fairly recent, atheist advertisement on a London bus, which read, God probably doesn't exist, so get on and enjoy your life. But we have to be cautious about the implications of what we know. Epistemological claims have no necessary connection with existence claims. Not least because there's no logical reason why there shouldn't be many facts, or whatever you choose to call them, which are intelligible, but not to the human mind. So that note that the wary Pyrrhonist does not deny truth. He's strictly agnostic, both whether it exists and whether we can know it. So we should refer to absolute truth deniers as desiderate Pyrrhonists, an inferior form of the original animal. Even if we create truth, there's something true which we've created, Every creation is what it is and not another thing, as G.E. Moore might have put it. And we can still claim that it's possible to lie. But perhaps to deny objective truth, again, is an epistemological claim. It's not possible to find an objective standpoint, a view from nowhere, from which to view the possibilities of truth and falsehood. Thus, among apparent truth deniers, we distinguish those who are adamant that objective truth doesn't exist, those who say that it may exist but it's unknowable by us, and those who say that if and only if it's created by us does it really exist. In any case, if P is a lie, 
it's true that it is somehow untrue. Ancient Pyrrhonists seem less reckless than some of their modern counterparts. Desiderate Pyrrhonists commit themselves to a number of highly implausible and counterintuitive inferences about the nature of language, to which Alistair Campbell has already borne witness. One of these, of course, is studied in the justly esteemed and illuminating article of Harry Frankfurt entitled On Bullshit. Frankfurt's principal point is that there's a category of human discourse of theoretically endless duration to which the categories of truth and falsehood are completely irrelevant. The aim is to give the impression of irrelevance while committing oneself to nothing at all, either because one's trying to evade committing oneself to something at, or anything at all, or because there is nothing at all, at least in the area of the discourse in progress, to which commitment could be given. In a surprisingly frank, if ultimately over and sanitised comment to a journalist, another of Blair's assistants, Robin Cook, his first, the first self-styled ethical foreign secretary, gave an informative description of how to handle a media interview. Quote, the art of the interview is to talk for an hour without saying anything too interesting, as quotes. But of course it must seem interesting, and that's where we know the irrelevance of the categories of truth and falsehood. The old joke, how can you tell whether a politician is lying, answer, see if he moves his lips, misses a key point. The politician is often no more lying than telling the truth, nor is he intending to do either of those things. But of course, in avoiding telling the truth, he still evinces some sort of recognition that there is a truth to tell. The idea of truth seems rather hard to dispense with. It seems deeply implicated in ordinary discourse. But if Augustine, following the words of Jesus, were right that it's to be associated with God, then those who deny God must, in some as yet unclear sense, and perhaps unbeknown even to themselves, deny truth also. In a book entitled Real Presences, for example, George Steiner argued that denial of syntactical intelligibility is indeed a tacit denial of God. That's, of course, rebuking Nietzsche. Hence, it may be important to see how radical any denial of truth implicitly really is, and whether if to deny some or all truth intelligibility is to deny God, then whether the converse also applies. But now we need to recognise another obvious but often neglected point about bullshit. The animal exists, but its existence and the recognition of its existence tells us nothing decisively new about truth and falsehood. It's a way of using language for purposes other than truthfully or untruthfully informing. Its aim is simply to delude and confuse. Traditionally, this might be called a catechistic or parasitic function of language. But there are no surprising conclusions to be drawn from that. Language has all sorts of functions, not least that of arousing emotional responses. But that doesn't eliminate the apparent fact that one of its other functions, perhaps its primary function, is to point deliberately, whether or not also accurately, towards what the speaker believes to be the truth. Truth indeed will be what he may intend to express. I've confronted the claim that what we can know determines what there really is with two kinds of objections. The first is that there's no a priori reason why the claim should be true. The second is that the existence of other purposes of language than that of recording what is the case has no bearing on whether language is an appropriate tool for telling the truth. Indeed, that the nature of bullshit points to the fact that at least those who resort to it are aware of what they're doing namely, determining not to speak what is true, or for that matter, what they believe to be false. So have those desiderate pyrrhonists who deny the existence of any realm of truth any further possible moves? They normally tend to rely on one of two possible approaches, what I may call the metaphysical, perhaps counter-metaphysical would be a better term, or the genealogical. The latter is a more recent idea, at least in its formalised version, being largely dependent on Nietzsche, as well as being much less interesting, philosophically that is, rather than sociologically. So I'll comment on that first. The key move normally made by genealogists is dogmatic. That is, all human activity is determined by a conscious or unconscious concern with power and manipulation. 
or in the earlier, rather similar, Hobbesian version of the same story, with at least adequate capacity to secure one's personal survival. The two options come closer together in that one's own preservation, physical or intellectual, in what amounts to a zero-sum game, is tied in with controlling and manipulating other people. There are at least two objections to that. The first is that there's no reason to believe that all human behaviour is driven solely by considerations either of power or of self-preservation, even if, and that too is rather implausible, such considerations form part of the motivation for our every individual action. But the Hobbesian, as well as the deconstructionist, requires that all our actions be motivated by the search for the power to preserve ourselves or impose ourselves on others. To assert that much is merely to assert an unhelpful and ideological dogma. That remains true whether the search for power is thought to be conscious or unconscious. The second objection is equally forceful. Even if it were true that our moral claims are motivated largely or even entirely by the desire to dominate or to survive, that has no bearing on whether what we assert about the truths of morality, for example, is correct. I assert P because I want to dominate tells nothing about the truth or falsehood of P. Facts cannot be inferred from our attitudes, beliefs or wishes, whether conscious or subconscious. Even if those beliefs or wishes about one's own psychology or that of others are in fact correct. Interesting though many genealogical claims may be about the mental state of philosophers or other humans, they are of little help either positively or negatively in any pursuit of objective truth, as distinct that is from the historical question of why we believe or disbelieve what is true. Most genealogists are in fact guilty of a very simple category mistake. They confuse psychological with ontological information. To put it more bluntly, they ask, where are you coming from, instead of inquiring whether a proposition is true. The best can be said of that approach is that if we know where someone's coming from, we may better understand why he can't understand what is in fact the correct solution to a philosophical problem. But if we understand why he can't grasp the right answer, we assume that there is a right answer for him to grasp. It's worth recording, however, that from the point of view of understanding intellectual history, whether of a culture or of an individual, it's indeed necessary to recognise what may be the mental roadblocks which for the time being necessarily impede further intellectual advance. A much more interesting and more traditional objection to the possibility of our acquiring knowledge of what is true, though not again to the existence or otherwise of objective truth, is that it's impossible to capture the essence of a thing and therefore the knowledge of it. A stronger version of this objection would be that in any case there are no essences to capture and that all claims about the possibility of objective truth depend on the existence of such essences. But both versions of this objection are manifestly false. See how hard it is even to talk about our subject without introducing the F word, i.e. false. For again, whether or not we can capture the essence of something has little to do with whether we can know anything true about it. If someone asked me what I know about Thomas Levergood, I could list a number of his sterling qualities. But although my list might be largely correct, I should not have captured the essence of Thomas Levergood, even if he has one. You can see that if you look at the list, you can see that if you look at the list of attributes and then say, is that all there is to him? Indeed, essences, if they exist, are the subject of definitions. And definitions, though useful, are mere descriptions in terms of class membership. As Aristotle said, the individual is known either by mental or physical perception. He, she, or it has no definition. So if capturing is grasping an essence, as essences are normally understood, it gives us only very partial understanding of the individual whom we've tried to capture. But let me repeat, we do not need to know what the essence of an object is to know, in some useful sense of know, what it is, that is, to answer the question, what's that? That is, to be able to identify it and put our identification to use in a specific and definable context. If, as a pious Islamist, I want a stone to throw at an adulteress, I don't need to know its molecular structure as I reach for the stone. 
but I really am looking for a stone, as my victim will eventually discover. And again, the fact, if it is a fact, that I can't capture an essence tells me nothing about whether essences exist and hence whether statements about them can be true or false. And I should add a further corollary. The above proposition is still informative whether essences, if they exist, are static or, as some would have them, dynamic. Given the notion of knowing in a context, as with the nature of stones, the full-blown desiderate Pyrrhonist thesis to which I've alluded has few devotees of strict observance among professional philosophers. These may prefer to accept that knowledge is true belief in as much as it can be tested empirically or analytically. But that allows them, they may suppose, to be more sceptical in ethics and aesthetics, and among those for whom such interests are dominant, the stronger version of the sceptical thesis is more likely to flourish. Hence, historically, that stronger version is more likely to be current coin in trendy departments of English, where attacks on the semi-traditional canon of great writers, together with ideas about authorship being socially determined to the point that the author virtually disappears, have enabled it to sport a part philosophical, part sociological fig leaf. I shall return in a moment to this literary version of the disappearance of truth when I'm able to look at it in a wider context. For the traditional study of literature and a literary canon does involve value judgments. Shakespeare is traditionally held to be somehow a better writer in a non-ideological sense than the average churner out of chick lit, though in reflecting on its high rating in a recent government-sponsored assessment of research in British universities, one English department did claim to have been commended as, quote, cutting edge, precisely because, but hopefully not exclusively, of its innovative treatment of chick lit. And it is to that wider context of value judgments that we must turn. For while he or she who denies that water is, so far as we know, exclusively H2O, will normally be written off as a flat earther or some other kind of nutter, it being assumed that the empirical testing of hypotheses is a guide to at least provisional, and in many cases more than provisional, truth, the philosopher who claims that beauty is simply in the eye of the beholder, or that moral propositions are relative, being determined by the, by the judgment, not the discernment of the speaker, is paid hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever, plus all due respect for his wisdom and shrewd reductionism. Shrewd because in inspecting value judgments, he has shown that all such truth is relative, and inter alia, that there are no such absolutes as right and wrong. How could there be if each of us determines the purely personal motives that action A is immoral or that X is a beautiful poem? All actions, qua actions that is, are amoral, but we decide to select which are to be labelled moral or immoral, whether as individuals or by the conventions of the society in which we live, or ideologically hope to live. Hence it's often the habit of the present time to term behaviour appropriate or inappropriate where we used to say right or wrong. In a world to which I now live, we are living not philosophically, that is by justifying our beliefs in terms of their truth value, but pragmatically, in terms of their effectiveness in bringing about the sort of society we want to live in or to promote, though of course some actions will seem to be truly effective, others not. Generally speaking, such effectiveness is given a social rather than a solipsistic context, for since we are communicating, indeed syntactical animals, it's presumably impossible for us to live without intentionally or unintentionally promoting our own beliefs and thus contributing to the constant reshaping of what is said to be ultimately nothing more than a conventional consensus. Of course, the difficulty of this is shown when we ask, for example, of the Holocaust, whether we merely didn't like what happened or thought that it was not in the interest of the greatest number of us or indeed that it made us feel unsafe. Though it might seem that we should speak in some such terms, but instead we tend to make truth claims. We're inclined to say that was just wrong. Indeed, when a once well-known philosopher denied this before a fairly sophisticated audience, and in reply to the question, did Hitler do anything wrong, gave us his honest opinion that he did not, he lost his audience. But his point was well taken. The word wrong gave the wrong impression. It seemed to refer to some non-mind-dependent reality, which the philosopher in question thought we needed to have no further truck with. 
Yet the reply, I cannot say that Hitler actually did anything wrong, was not well received by the audience, despite the fact that on their own principles, many of the members of that audience ought to have applauded it. Most members of the public, educated or not, who have bought, bought into the notion that at least all values, aesthetic and moral, are relative, are content to leave it at that. If their position is challenged, they will say, it works for me, perhaps nursing the forlorn hope that its rationality could be shown by some smart airport professor if he really wanted to set his mind to it. And that working is important. There's a widespread and well-founded belief that if nihilism became the recognised norm, society would collapse and my own self-preservation, not to speak of my wish to dominate, would be under threat. To avoid that undesirable result, a number of moves are possible, some of them philosophical. A recently very popular one is to say that value terms are rather like Locke and secondary qualities. Locke's definition of a secondary quality is as follows, this is from the essay 2.8. Quote, secondary qualities are nothing in the things themselves but powers to produce various sensations, close quotes. These sensations arise in our minds, which are all hardwired in approximately the same way when we meet up with certain facts or events. These facts or events are liable to produce a sense of value in our mind, which is a kind of blank sheet curiously capable of being aware of itself when receiving, or perhaps better, imbibing, specific impressions within some particular social context. So these impressions come out as objective value judgments that seem to be binding at least within one's local community, and some say are of wider, even universal significance. One of the difficulties there, however, is how to explain why some people grasp their binding nature while others, labelled criminals, do not. Nature, or more likely nurture, will then be briskly trotted out to anaesthetise the problem. It's hard to see exactly what the invocation of Locke amounts to or why it's thought to solve our present problem. Normal Lockean secondary qualities are sense-affecting characteristics of physical objects. So presumably value judgments depend on mind-recognisable, not physical qualities of these objects. The combination of a thinking subject and, say, a potentially aesthetic object produces certain ideas about the aesthetic worth of the object concerned. But the parallel is not at all exact. In the case of ordinary secondary qualities, as understood by Locke, the sense organ meets a specific sort of physical object in a specific circumstance, which it then views and interprets in a particular way, perhaps by setting a colour. But for value recognition, the mind itself would have to be the primary cause of the aesthetic characteristic identified. For although in sense perception there's a meeting of physical objects, both of which, say the eye and the tree, can be identified as distinct and with a distinct location, with value perception there's no such meeting, unless, of course, aesthetic and moral reactions and judgments are either entirely mechanistic or that only the illusion of judgment involved or they are simply recognitions of pleasure and pains associated with certain kinds of experiences. And we then interpret those pleasures and pains as, say, good and bad, and hence, as Aristotle might put it, as beautiful and ugly. The latter solution amounts to explaining aesthetic and moral treat reactions in terms of what's been called emotivism, and the problems with that are well enough known. For one thing, it doesn't explain how we can intelligently say I don't like this, but it's clearly the right thing to do. Which leads us to the overall conclusion that to compare value predicates with Lockean secondary qualities is a posh way of saying that we ourselves read them consciously or at first subconsciously into the experiences, whether of objects or events, with which we become acquainted. Indeed, their only relationship to Lockean secondary qualities, as normally understood, is that they are recognised, though not through the senses, as it were, quote, by us in an act of experiencing, close quotes. But this recognition, not being merely descriptive, must be mind-generated. Locke and secondary qualities are not generated in that way, so that the comparison between what Locke is discussing and what's offered to us as an account of value predicates can't be pressed very far. To compare value judgment with Locke and secondary qualities may explain their objective status, but precisely not the fact that they are binding or even that they are specifically judgments of value. 
it's possible to say, I'm supposed to be hardwired into thinking that this is beautiful, but so what? I like destroying beautiful things. Or in the ethical case, I like killing do-gooders. What such examples show is that there's no necessary moral obligation to respect either conventional judgments or the effects of hardwired or evolved emotional reactions. Such respect seems to be one of the possible effects of our being free, nor are we even required to believe that perverse reactions arise because we claim to recognize something, quote, transcendent about the goods we are rejecting. When Goering on one occasion said that every time he heard the word Geist, he flicked the safety catch of his revolver, he was not being particularly anti-transcendentalist as a revolutionary. As he said himself, he was simply being a revolutionary. The comparison with Locke and secondary qualities won't do. So where does that leave us with our two types of objective truth? For objective truth, even about values, is still on the table, even if value predicates are somehow invented, to, to borrow the appropriate and well-worn phrase of John Mackey. For whether values exist in some kind of quasi-platonic realm, or as divine attributes, or are invented by Mackey or the rest of us, they still are what they are, and it's possible to lie about them, just as it's possible to lie about fictitious characters like Alice in Wonderland. If one lied about Alice, perhaps by saying that she's an Australian, one is lying about what is in this realm of the discourse in which Alice exists, the true state of affairs. Yet the two types of objectivity of value with which we are now concerned differ in important, if obvious, respect. One objective family, of which platonic forms are the most famous instance, would be mind-independent. The other would be in some way conventional and determined by whatever criterion a particular society uses, which might be rationality, to establish what it might think of as mind-dependent objectivity, the realms of fiction, morality, and aesthetics. The latter two classes would, in effect, be parts of the former. So if value predicates are not very like Lockean secondary qualities, how are they to be explained? Let's grasp, grant that there is a sense in which they'll have to be conventional, or at least acceptable to use current diction to society or to its political elites. An increasingly popular expedient, going back in some form at least to Sidgwick at the end of the 19th century, may be labelled the as-if approach. Though we, whoever we are, have long rejected mind-independent value terms, we recognise that they are useful, and since usefulness is the only standard left to us, we naturally appeal to it. Swidgick's original problem was to reconcile happiness and duty, and he admits that he's failed in his attempt to do that. His solution, which he proposed with some hesitation, is that it may be necessary to conceal the truth about morality from the general public reserving, that is, it is for the elites. Naturally, such a suggestion is not out of keeping for a utilitarian. So long as lying or deceiving is held to be in the interest of the majority, it is acceptable. Hence, be careful of trusting a utilitarian professor, unless you know that his life is different from, i.e., better than, his theory. As for Sidgwick, perhaps he deserves pity as well as the raised eyebrow. It's interesting to notice that Plato in the Laws faced what at first sight looks this identical dilemma. He had been arguing that the just life is always more pleasant than the unjust, but he notes that if that were not the case, then the lawgiver would have to lie to say that it is more pleasant. But this is a different case from that of Sidgwick, since Plato thinks that in fact he's got good arguments for his position, while Sidgwick admits that he has no such ammunition left in his, in his, in his, in his revolver. But Plato's comment is interesting. It implies that he thinks that in the absence of morality, but only then, social cohesion backed by what would conventionally be called lying would become the dominant consideration. Sidgwick's apparently dishonest solution finds favour well beyond utilitarians. In an at least tacit form, it infects almost the whole of contemporary moral philosophy. As long ago as 1954, in a deservedly influential article, Elizabeth Anscombe argued that most contemporary moral discussion is vitiated because philosophers constantly employ moral terms which are appropriate and defensible only if they're supported by a psychological or, or, and or metaphysical infrastructure 
while those who deploy them normally reject such an infrastructure. I myself in the past have pursued this difficulty in the case of Kant, who is still widely thought of in some quarters as having evaded it. Yet unfortunately, Anscombe's observations may have helped promote a situation with which she would have no sympathy at all. If we accept their implications, there remain two alternatives. Either we return at least to metaphysics, if not to theology, and deny the autonomy of ethics, or we carry on with ethics in an unreal world as though Anscombe had never spoken. But why should we adopt the latter course? That question brings us back to Sidgwick and his judgment that to fail to come up with a coherent ethical theory is too dangerous to the social fabric. The nasty little secret must not be allowed to get out among the hoi polloi. That patronising, if apparently socially respectable and responsible attitude, is what was dubbed by Bernard Williams as government house consequentialism. One difficulty with Sidgwick's move, and the less bashful ones which have followed more recently, is that by making it, philosophers cease to be philosophers. That is, traditionally, people seeking the truth, the existence of which they now may deny. We have seen some of the ambiguities of that move, but they become, in fact, pragmatic social engineers. Sometimes they may disguise this by writing what are, in effect, two different kinds of books. Thus, John Rawls has written philosophically in A Theory of Justice and as a social engineer and ideologist in political liberalism. An alternative strategy was adopted by the late Richard Rorty, who abandoned the Department of Philosophy in favour of the Department of Comparative Literature. As I've already indicated, I'll say more in a moment about such departments, and hence about whether Rorty was right and indeed honest and consistent in making that sort of move. The bad effect of Anscombe's influential article seems to have been that along with other factors, of course, it caused people to believe that metaphysics of some pre-enlightenment sort is needed for a robust and mind-independent objectivism in ethics without persuading that such a position is philosophically tenable. So more and more moralists find and found themselves in the position of Sidgwick. They believe that transcendental objectivism in ethics is impossible while fearing with Sidgwick that some form of what's been called a common morality is necessary for social cohesion. In those circumstances, the only remaining alternative is to pretend that their ethical claims have some kind of firm foundation while knowing perfectly well that they have not. Some indeed have been more brazen and denied the need for foundations altogether, at least for foundations which could be agreed upon. That essentially is the position of rules in political liberalism and of Rorty more generally. It's well summed up by Rorty's astonishing remark that the, that the problem with Robespierre and Danton, not to speak of Sophocles, Antigone and Creon, is that they did not make sufficient efforts to reach a deal. I've characterised that comment elsewhere as perhaps the most crass and insensitive observation by a learned man about the fundamental dilemmas of moral philosophy that I've ever read so far. So the practical alternatives are to deny the needs for foundations or to pretend that they exist while believing firmly that they don't. Both alternatives, in their different ways, deny the necessity for robustly objective truth in ethics. For truth, as Peter Mandelson had so well put it in the past I quoted, is to be created by the performers in the stage play of human life, that is, by the spin doctors and their sometimes more high-minded philosophical role models. So let me sum up the current situation as, as follows. There's a kind of sentimental nostalgia for foundations and for metaphysics, but that nostalgia can be abated by what I've called the as-if morality. Courage and self-control, for example, can't be shown to be virtues, but let's encourage the ordinary guy in his primitive belief that they are, or probably are. Of course, ordinary guys will not appeal directly to metaphysics. Some of them might appeal to religion, normally in our society to some form of Christianity, others to a kind of pre-philosophical intuition that there really is a difference between good and bad, precisely the kind of belief which Plato in the Republic thought needed to be protected from sophistic subversion by dialectic and the theory of transcendent objects, and from which Mackey, for example, believed we need to be freed by some kind of, quote, error theory, that is, by a theory which would teach us that such pre-philosophical delusions are rather like a belief in Santa Claus, or some would say in God. 
something the mature human needs to grow out of. So if some philosophers are nostalgic at least for the good effects of metaphysical foundationalism, while the ordinary guy may still, if increasingly nostalgically, look to religious belief, it's now worthwhile to turn to another area of academic study in order to see how it's possibly nostalgic for both at the same time, but perhaps primarily at the general cultural level for religion, in particular for Christianity. Such a digression will seem less of a digression when it's complete and may shed light both on the aesthetic questions to which I have alluded several times and on Rorty's decision to abandon philosophy for comparative literature. Indeed, that very word comparative introduced the story very well. And as we proceed, it'll be helpful also to notice how the word nostalgia itself is liable to encourage a diminished respect for truth. I'm sure it'll come as no surprise if I say that the phrase comparative religions arouses mixed feelings. Clearly the comparison of religions can be an informative and worthwhile academic practice, but it doesn't always work out like that. Comparatists are often people who know no religion well enough to present its finer points, and in some cases this ignorance is particularly in evidence when they discuss the history and nature of the doctrines to which they themselves purport to subscribe. Naturally, I'm more aware of this problem when I listen to Christians talking about Christianity, but there's good reason to believe that Christians are not the only offenders. Be that as it may, one of the effects of comparative ignorance is a blurring, as well as an exaggerating, of distinctions. From my point of view, I'm more concerned with the blurring, for it's inclined to lead to the ecumenical view that all religions are equally true, equally beneficial, indeed that, in essence, they preach more or less the same thing, or they can at least be reduced to doing so. And analogous difficulties can arise in comparative literature, since few can be masters of all the material they wish to examine, and, here comes the new point, many uh, many conduct their comparative analysis under the auspices of some overriding theory or ideology, which distorting lens brings me back, naturally enough, to the presentation, not this time of our own religion, in my case Christianity, but to our own literary history, the history of English literature, by which I would normally mean in its pleasant avatar, literature written in English. In the, in the United Kingdom, by the middle of the 19th century, not only much of the industrial working class, but a high percentage of the cultural elites had abandoned Christianity, some with rejoicing, others, more interesting in the present discussion, with varying degrees of regret. And from Matthew Arnold on, literary critics in particular tried to assert a religion of aesthetics, especially of poetry, in place of the religion of Christ. The beginning of this movement is often identified in Arnold's poem on Dover Beach, now of course famously parodied as the Dover Bitch, though an important ancestor can be recognised in Shelley's Defence of Poetry 1821, but only published posthumously in 1840, and an early prophet of its risks can of course be found in the Neoplatonically inclined Coleridge. Shelley, however, presents himself as a proto-Nietzschean who delights in, in, rather than regrets, the fading of Christianity, looking for the superiority of art to the banal distinctions of morality between right and wrong and calling for an end to the abjectness of Christian ethics. As founder of an alternative tradition, however, Arnold was not so sure that the coming changes would be attractive, let alone exhilarating, though he has his hopes and certainly believes the development of European culture into a post-Christian phase is quite inevitable. In On Dover Beach, we, of course, read of the long, melancholy, long, withdrawing roar of the Sea of Faith. Such hesitant hopes were supported by the erection of the literature of classical Greece and, to a lesser extent, of classical Rome into the model of an anti-Christian alternative culture, still recognisable not only in A.E. Hausman in the 30s of the last century, but in the minds of those who composed the prologue to the intended constitution of the European Union, presenting the notion that the culture of Europe passed from the ancient world directly to the Renaissance and the Reformation and finally to the Enlightenment. Wherever possible, nothing Christian and medieval was to be included in the new canon of cultural sources, and in the spirit of Arnold's Whig history, the message of authors who could hardly be omitted but were in fact Christian, such as Dante and Shakespeare, was read in terms not of goodness, let alone of God, but of love and beauty. Beauty in effect, and very unclassically of course, had been separated from goodness. 
As a student in Cambridge in the 1950s, in the last generation to be taught this kind of classicism and its associated anti-Christian canon, I found it so deeply rooted and so taken for granted that I happily assumed rather than recognised its positively anti-Christian temper. By my time, most of the nostalgia of Matthew Arnold had disappeared from the departments of classics, the more overt hostility of Shelley having prevailed. Though for just a few more years, notably through the influence of the great critic F.R. Leavis and, and the respect at least for the Christian T.S. Eliot, nostalgia retained its place among the so-called Levites in departments of English, to which I shall return shortly in connection with the de facto disappearance of truth. As for the bleaker and, nos- and, nost- and uh, consciously anti-Christian alternative, a caricature complete with unconscious rather than consciously anti-Christian alternative, or, uh, or, sorry, complete with unconscious rather than nostalgic memories of the lost world of metaphysical morality and reminding the more learned reader of a cynical reprise of the tone of the final lines of Thucydides' account of the end of the Athenian expedition to Sicily at the end of the classical 5th century BC, can be recognised in part of the autobiography of Sir Kenneth Dover. Dover is writing of his travels as president of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, and of his dilemma when faced with the happy possibility of ridding himself of an obnoxious fellow named Trevor Astin, quote, It was clear to me that Trevor and the college must somehow be separated, and my problem was one which I feel compelled to define with brutal candour, how to kill him without getting into trouble. I had no qualms about causing the death of a fellow from whose non-existence the college would benefit, but I balked at the prospect of misleading a coroner's jury whose raison d'etre was to discover the truth. But even Dover was not entirely free from nostalgia, at least for a Christian vocabulary and the emotional sentiment which it may, meretriciously or otherwise, arouse when he wrote in the same book, quote, Innocent life is sacrosanct, and the duty to protect it compelling. Respect for the life of even the worst behaved humans seems to be an aberration of post-enlightenment Christianity, close quotes. No prizes will be awarded yet to those who can recognise the number of errors, undefended assumptions and confusions in so few words. We return to Matthew Arnold and his religion of poetry and culture. Such a religion, as all religions, demands value judgments. Thus some literature is better than other. Hence not only the construction of a canon, but in this case the construction of a moral canon. Arnold himself had more time for the decent Wordsworth than for the immoral Shelley and Byron or to the opium sodden Coleridge from whom he could actually have learned a good deal. For him, the weakness of Byron's, quote, coarseness is parallel to the, quote, narrowness and philistinism of the uncultured evangelicals and the obscurantist Catholics. None of these people is properly cultured, he says. Quote, those who cannot read Greek should read nothing but Milton and Wordsworth, in his quotes. We recognise in that last remark an overinflated version of the view that the pre-Christian Greeks were best suited to replace the dying Christianity. But clearly, and Arnold knew it, such a culture is possible only for the very few. Though in the earlier 20th century attempts were made, and I suppose still are being made, to widen the classical appeal by extensive translation. But that same next century was also to see a more plausible substitute Christianity, perhaps more able to transform the philistinism and utilitarianism which it was said dominated English social society. The critic F.R. Leavis, who died as late as 1978, when his lifetime's work was already well nigh demolished, shared Arnold's nostalgia but reacted practically, working most of his life to construct, or rather finish constructing, a purely English canon, which is to be both moral and aesthetic. That canon was to contain writers who both met Leavis' own demanding intellectual standards, above all he hated meaningless poetry that relied purely on sound and emoting, and who offered a moral substitute for religion itself. In the undergraduate programme at Cambridge, his name was particularly associated with the so-called English Moralist paper, in which poets, novelists and others were to be canonised as post-Christian moral saints though many of them were not English at all, and some, of course, were Christian. The syllabus included Greek tragedy and translation, Dante and Tasso, and even St. Paul, all read primarily for their deism, all acting as literary religion substitutes, 
all propounding a version of that as if and foundationless morality, which you've already seen has become recently so attractive to professed philosophers and ex-philosophers. For here is indeed a practical alternative to metaphysics and theology, and an alternative which can adopt much of the language of theology drained of its earthy religious content and context. This phenomenon was noted by Charles Taylor in such lines of Wallace Stevens, for example, as, quote, After one has abandoned belief in God, poetry is the essence which takes its place as life's redemption, close quotes. But as I have noted elsewhere, this is only a virtual redemption. Stevens, and recall the debased version of a similar sleight of hand in the remark of Dover about what is sacrosanct, is, reply, is relying on an impossible and hence abandoned theology to support some kind of religion of culture. But he's not entitled to urge us to accept, except nostalgically, a set of linguistic and conceptual practices whose basis he himself has quite specifically rejected. The parallel with Sidgwick's government house consequentialism with its more calculated deception can hardly be missed. For throughout the whole cultural tradition from Arnold through Santiago to Stevens, as well as in Levis's hatred for philistinism and utilitarianism, the prophets come, perhaps perforce, to the same, if more nostalgic, virtual redemption, indeed virtual truth. It's easy to understand that sensitive individuals would regret the passing of any possibility of defending goodness, even if they think they can still uphold beauty. Yet whatever poetry can do, it cannot redeem. And those who try and persuade us that, of itself it can, are encouraging us, and, live, and indeed themselves, to live what is in fact a lie. A note that I add, and themselves. For already in the Republic, Plato had noticed that in the end, the deceiver, the propagandist, will come to believe his own deceptions, his own propaganda. That's the sense in which Peter Mandelson is right. The spin doctor, whether of politics or art, creates the truth. Plato and Aristotle, of course, called such people sophists, though they recognised that some of them were more well-intentioned than others, if perhaps equally self-deluding. So we see a virtual world being created not only by philosophers but by literary critics, though for different reasons. And in the time of Levis, not to say of Eliot, that virtual world, unlike that of Sidgwick, was an honest if regretful attempt to salvage the truths, quotes, of a morality from the wreckage of the Christian religion. But such a construction, built on sand and in part on snobbishness, and essentially asserted from on high rather than justified from its roots, could not possibly last. A morality must necessarily follow a cult of intelligible beauty buttress, if that's the right word, only by dislocated fragments of a morality that survived the receding of the sea of faith. And so when the arrival of theory replaced the practical criticism of Levis and I.A. Richards in literary circles, coupled as it was with a recent abandonment of history and tradition, and later with an ideologically fueled challenge to Levis's newly formed canon of dead white males, the collapse was obviously complete. Already in Levis's lifetime, it appeared what in Britain was called the New Criticism. Essentially, this was the idea that a poem should be studied from its bare text alone. Gone were the old-fashioned philological ideas which emanated from the tradition of teaching Greek and Latin, and which had often indeed tended to dissolve a poem into its sources and cultural background, while discouraging its practitioners from making more than the most broad-based and indeed trivial value judgments about those who wrote in some supposed golden age. But the English canon must be based on value judgments, not least in the minds of such as Levis and Richards, about the intellectual quality of the particular poem, and given that the poem itself existed in a recognisable historical context. But now, with the so-called new criticism, the baby disappeared with the bathwater. The historical background to the work under discussion was deliberately abandoned, and the result was an ever-growing belief that since we couldn't determine the poet's intention, or even subject matter in many cases, but only measure, for example, his musicality, the critic was eventually left to write his own poem. Objective study thus being discounted, the way was open for the later deconstructive phase whereby history, intelligibility, authorial purpose were all to be replaced by some overarching thesis, often Marxist or Freudian, about what the poem must really and exclusively be about. So that the supposed liberation of the new critics came to be hijacked by interpretations governed either by theory neat 
or theory sexed up by genealogical accounts of what must be the power-driven intentions, whether conscious or unconscious, of the author. All this, of course, produced precisely the effects which Leavis and Richards would have deprecated. There was no true or even plausible standard of aesthetic excellence. It was all a matter of sociologically driven taste. Mickey Spillane really was as good as Shakespeare, or as John Lennon was as good as Jesus. At least this was the subtext, even if only a few self-styled radicals presented it out loud. The effect of such theory-driven accounts of both the literary canon and indeed of the very notion of objective excellence were naturally alien to the notion of truth. And as we found in the as-if theoreticians of the post Sidric school and the more brazen successors, so in the literary domain, similar inadequate justifications for keeping up the old ways were asserted by those nostalgic conservatives who had lost the confidence to argue that Shakespeare really is better than Ricky Spillane. For if there are no standards in the field of literary excellence, that would also be socially inconvenient, not least for the professors who could, who could profess no reason other than the fact they could be described as cutting edge why they were not themselves redundant, both culturally and financially. Perhaps I should add, however, that the recent movements of so-called new historicism, when separated from their originally dogmatic Marxist roots, offer an interesting field of activity which should keep them on the payroll, payroll a little longer, not least where the historical background to the literature they are studying is in fact illuminated by a refreshing revisionism, as is the case, for example, with the history of Tudor England. New historicism apart, however, we see repeated in the literary domain, I've no time here to comment further on art and music, the mentality of more, more modern moral philosophy, first pointed out by Anscombe, but now in its post-Anscombian phase. For Anscombe thought that the malaise of moral, modern moral philosophy was the effect of not realising that ethics cannot be separated and has not historically been separated from its metaphysical and sometimes religious roots. Whereas in the post anscomian phase, the as-if mentality, with the claim that foundationalism is both impossible and unnecessary, is brazenly promoted. While the unsuspecting public is left to assume that its traditional sounding claims about the necessity of virtue, duty and even responsibility are adequately defended. In ethics, therefore, and its original partner, aesthetics, concern for truth about objective values has disappeared or been replaced by ideology, to the extent that truth is held to be at least unknowable, at most non-existent. Instead, conventions prevail, being governed in democracies by the wishes of the majority, or, those, or rather of those who can pass themselves off as the spokespersons of the majority. Vox Populi, of course, Vox Dei. In After Virtue, fearing the barbarians already inside the gates, Macintyre fantasised about the need for a new composite of Trotsky and St. Benedict, Elsewhere, in similar vein, he argues that serious humane studies are increasingly impossible in universities and might need to find a new or reconstructed home. However unrealistic all this may appear, there's much evidence in favour of Mackendall's indictment of what universities are actually doing in the humanities. Instead of being centres in which truth is regularly sought, they have often become the engine that drives the thesis that truth doesn't exist hence their frightening tendency to become hotbeds of political correctness, for convention is all, of grade inflation, for we are or should be all in the same intellectual boat, and of arrogance, for if, if we alone understand that the mass of unenlightened folk are floundering in a morass of pre-philosophical, often religious ignorance, which they should be induced to refute, or better, more effectively, to ignore. Thinking religious people will recognise the subhuman mindlessness of this, but they're not the only ones to have sensed the problem. Perhaps faith may explain things, but it can't justify them. That's why fundamentalists have to reject history and learning as well as the logic of those who are now to be dismissed as too clever by half. On the other hand, those still concerned for truth may prefer a different tack. Transcendent objective reality and a value system which depended on it well before Christian times. That's why Iris Murdoch, for example, wanted to return to Plato. For her, the nostalgia, of which I have spoken on, took a different form. Christianity, indeed any theism, is alas impossible. 
but perhaps its Hellenic philosophical underpinnings can be sustained when separated from the regrettably parochial Abrahamic monotheism, as Voltaire might, indeed almost did, maintain, with which they'd become intertwined. We need to abandon religion, but we don't need to abandon metaphysics, so long as we can satisfy ourselves that metaphysics need not point toward religion. In Plato's, but Murdoch herself was guilty of an ignorance, or at least a neglect, of the history of her beloved Platonism itself. In Plato's original theory of transcendent values, the forms, at least, are a necessary condition for any understanding of moral virtues, as well as for the stability of moral language. But in themselves, as Plato came to see, they are insufficient as explanatory factors. Their existence tells us what moral and aesthetic qualities are, 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 but does nothing to promote them. For that, some kind of active principle or mind, or what we would call God, capital G, and Plato perhaps God, small g, is required. Hence, with Aristotle's help, the Neoplatonists developed the history of the theory of transcendent and active moral qualities as varieties of divine attributes that unified the disparate elements of Plato's original ideas thus offering a more viable philosophical justification for the transcendent values of morality. For murder, all specifically Christian features of such understanding and such transcendence, the features which might encourage Christianity, had to be expunged, which left her in exactly the position which Plato himself had been forced to abandon and which the Neoplatonists held to be untenable, and therefore, they claimed, was obviously not advocated by Plato himself. I once heard, I know it in a parallel example, Jules saw make a comment, if it's true, Aquinas would have held it. So Murdoch, bravely but unsatisfactorily, felt the nostalgia for the metaphysics, but agreed with Arnold, Levis and the rest that the theism is impossible. For her, there can be no resort to an amoral or value-free world above good and evil, no desperate substitution of beauty for goodness. Yet the good has now lost contacts with the realities of existence among moving, planning earthly people, remaining only as a paradigm in heaven. Plato had foreseen and feared versions of this possibility in the first part of his Parmenides. But contrary to what Plato mistakenly thought to be the case when he propounded the original version of the theory of goodness, Murdoch's form of the good is, by contrast, of no defensible earthly and practical use for most of us, thus remaining, in effect, a philosophical dinosaur. I glanced earlier at the view of George Steiner that where we have intelligibility and therefore the possibility of distinguishing the true from the false, we necessarily have God. I am less convinced that Steiner had, than Steiner is that an argument of this kind can be made about all truths, specifically about so-called analytic or empirical truths. At least I would say the argument there is more difficult to, to sustain and certainly it would seem that Steiner would be hard-pressed to argue in this way for a transcendent God. What I do want to say, however, and here I'm in curious agreement with the as-if boys and girls, is that if some sort of theism which builds on Plato's account of value terms, whether ethical or aesthetic, and for him there's little distinction, is necessary if we are not to become pragmatic liars a la Sidgwick. But wait, you'll say, Sidgwick does believe in something like truth i.e. that he has failed, but thinks that it should not be disseminated. While well, those I dubbed earlier, desiderate pyrrhonists, deny that there is any truth at all, except that on which we all agree, even if there's no philosophical reason why we should do so. Yet even if the claim is to be that truth is what we all agree on, there's still some sort of truth, though far from a binding one, except as much as we can't speak without assuming it, which I guess is Steiner's point which brings me back to where I started in the beginning. As we have seen, it's hard to deny the existence of truth without asserting that it's true, that there is no truth. But as we've also seen, the practical thrust of arguments about truth is often that at least in matters of value, we can't discover it. We've only to invent it, which means that moral and aesthetic truths exist only in a fictitious world. Obviously, there remains the logical possibility that the fictional world of others, that others, I or others construct, is in fact identical with a world independent of my inventive powers, and in practice, assumptions like that are regularly made, as when it's assumed, for example, by many, that legal obligations are necessarily morally binding. 
But this is clearly fallacious, as is the more basic and not infrequent deliberate Pyrrhonist claim that since we can't know what is true, there's no such thing as truth. Some form of theism may provide some kind of answer to some of our dilemmas. For if it's true that God exists and that he necessarily is of a certain type, then moral and aesthetic values exist and are, in, are inexplicable without reference to him, while vice and ugliness are explicable only in terms of his absence. One of the strangest philosophical positions which has been around since the 17th and 18th centuries is that even if there is a God, that makes no difference to the nature of the world as we ordinarily experience it. Originally, this sort of deism depended on the idea that we all, or that all we could know of God is that he starts the universe going because we can't find any other explanations to why there's a universe at all. But quasi-scientific arguments are not the only possible moves towards claiming that God, and yet a certain kind of God, actually exists and is therefore morally significant. Which points, as I've argued previously, to the Augustinian view, here he is again, that the hypothesis of God enables one to solve or at least emasculate various otherwise insoluble problems in the world in which we live and that the more such puzzles it solves or emasculates, the more plausible it becomes. There's no need to repeat such arguments now. What I would insist on, however, is that just as as-if moral qualities are not moral qualities, so an as-if God, even if claimed to be Christian, is of no philosophical use. For some Christians seem to think that God is a projection of the human mind a la Feuerbach. That suggestion is pragmatically helpful and it may enable those who hold it to live in a comforting delusion and to convey their delusion to others. But a toy mousetrap won't really catch mice. So where do we finish up? First, it's impossible to deny truth without asserting it, but second, we need to distinguish between different kinds of truths. There are what can be dubbed dub descriptive truths, which tell us in however limited a way what we may need for some particular purpose or as a way station on the, way, on the road to further knowledge. In the Parmenides, Plato made a claim rather like George Steiner's, namely that if there are no platonic forms, then dialectic, that is, honest philosophical thinking, becomes impossible. For then we literally don't know what we're talking about. That may be a bit reckless, because we can certainly predict what will happen if we take certain kinds of action and then check our predictions. Plato himself seems to have taken some time to recognise that discussion of the truth of apparent facts may need to be separated from discussion of apparent values. For in the domain of values, as distinct from that of events, we must choose between only three, only three options. Thus, killing an innocent is either A, neither good nor bad, but merely a fact for which an accurate description can be given, as of any other event, or B, it's bad, or C, we can pretend that it's bad. And people can be persuaded to accept any one of these three options. My point, though, is that if there exists a good God, then there is only one possible option. Killing the innocent is bad and should be avoided wherever possible. But in no other circumstances is such an option compelling. Certainly it couldn't be known to be true. In the absence of God, any pre-philosophical claims about its truth would remain in the world of opinion, Indeed, they'd be ultimately indemonstrable and arguably false. My own view is that they would be false. So if Jesus were God, his remark, I am the truth, makes eminent sense in and for both ethics and aesthetics. And we don't do God does indeed imply, in these cases, we don't do truth. Thank you for your attention.